and welcome to the one within all. Interverse amigos, without much doubt, we can all relate to the fact that this seemingly cushy and comfortable modern life brings each of us experiences that scar our psyches and lead us into dark and de-evolutionary thoughts, destructive behaviors, and dead-end roads. Whether it's from our collective childhood abandonments by parents who worked too much, loved too little, or didn't have the complete picture of knowledge to share how this world really works, or contamination from the corrosive culture of consumeristic craziness, our ability to recognize and heal from these traumas is continually diminished as we layer on bad habits, addictions, and the like in adulthood. So putting the brakes on your life's locomotive before it goes crashing over the cliff into oblivion requires many qualities of self-actualization to emerge, and we feel the clock ticking as our self-inflicted doom approaches. <laughs> Negative as all that may sound, the solutions to these problems have been with humanity for thousands of years. And my guest today has been exploring and engineering these cures to our consciousness crisis while leaving breadcrumbs down the path for others to follow out of the dark woods of existential angst. Ross Cessna is the creator of the Spiritual Phoenix podcast, a project dedicated to providing listeners with an honest and balancing perspective on mental illness and how to liberate oneself from being defined as crazy. What Western psychology has categorized as mental illness would sometimes be considered spiritual emergence by more high-minded and shamanic societies. Through his journey of overcoming his own mental breaks, medical diagnosis, childhood trauma, and early adult substance abuse, Ross lights the way for others who don't want to accept the usual doctor's opinion that crazy is only solved by a lifetime pharmaceutical prescription. Our mutual mission to illuminate the minds and hearts of our peers by capturing our journeys and podcasts leads me to expect and intend quite a powerful transmission to coherently harmonize in our conversation today. I especially look forward to diving into some of your experiences with metaphysical tools like the tarot, the I Ching, and anything else that you've been into lately, because the uh, four former mentioned two things have been instrumental for my development personally. With all that out of the way, dear friends, please momentarily crack open that scaly insectoid shadow carapace that guards your heart chakra and let loose a love blast of welcome light in Ross's direction. Ross, my dude, welcome to Interverse. Chance, thank you so much for this opportunity, man. Um, that intro gave me chills, bro. <laughs> like I was tingling when you were saying it because there is some words in there that I don't know um, that you even knew are like really relative to my personal journey. You mentioned something about a train or something like that in there, dude. And there's a whole lot of imagery. Maybe maybe we'll get the opportunity to dive into that and like the synchronicities of that train in my life. Um, it's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> the doom train. <laughs> <laughs> dude, and it actually has um, some implications to a, a family member in my past as well and it ties into my own journey. So I, I like to touch on that. You might have to remind me though. Why not just start there, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's that, let's start there. I guess that is a good place to start. So, I was talking to my dad um, about one of these experiences with like with my mental health stuff, and he said that he can remember a time when he was going to school. He went to uh, I want to say it was at OU or somewhere like that, and he was high on something, <laughs> and essentially he felt like this train was going to come for him, and he kind of remembers like seeing a train hit him and being like dismembered and seeing like being on an oper operating table and then dying essentially, um, which is freaking heavy, dude. Yeah. And then how this ties into me, um, there is a point at my second bout of psychosis, which lasted for the better part of a year where there was this train. Um, and I still hear the train all the time, but at that time I assumed that it was like going to whisk me off to like this, um, hunger game type city like the capital and i was going to be propelled in front of all these people and all, like all this various stuff and it was terrifying for me to hear that train um and later as i really began to re-piece my mind that train is kind of like the locomotion of projecting me towards a better life so it's somewhat similar to what i assumed that it would be but in a completely different direction i guess in a completely different meaning and it's like learning to repurpose some of those um, psychotic thoughts or whatever and reframe it into something mean meaningful and positive has been instrumental in, in my healing. And it was just weird. Um, there's like some kind of genetic memory or some kind of family connection with that train. And in some ways, I feel like my dad might have had a similar experience to me, but 
he kind of went a different direction with it because he's obviously a completely different person than me, not to diminish him. He he's who he needed to be for me to be where I'm at, I guess. It's just crazy, dude. <laughs> like I couldn't make that stuff up. Yeah. The repurposing of psychotic thoughts. That's a really, really interesting point because although most people don't have an, uh, you know, sort of auditory hallucination of hearing a train or some kind of thought that a train is coming for them. You know, that's maybe unique, of course, but there, there are thoughts that we have frequently, each and every one of us that are rooted in some sort of conceptual um, framework that we take for granted that we accepted long ago. And because of that root thought, that original decision that things were a certain way, uh, there's a whole chain of other thoughts that build off of that. And it's kind of, I'm racking my brain for a specific example, but I guess a really good general example would be just the fight or flight feeling or the adrenaline dump feeling, um, different physiological things that can happen to you that can be interpreted by your mind in a variety of ways. Like for me, there's certain times where I'll have an energetic experience internally. And when those things would come on, I, I eventually assumed that maybe this is what people were having when they thought they were having anxiety attacks because I'd feel this really strong rush of energy. I feel things would start kind of like going lighter and whiter, like almost like I was phasing out of existence. I get really freaked out and usually it would come with some sort of thought before it that was like, and this is definitely a psychotic thought for me, I would think because it's completely uh, delu- it, or delusional and irrational. But I would think something like, well, this, I realize that this entire experience is some sort of um, simulated delusion or uh, illusion. And since I know it because of whatever chain of thought I just had, now I'm going to wake up from it and everything's going to disappear and everything I've done or all the people I care about, all of it's going to vanish because it wasn't real. And I, because I thought I knew that, that's what let me have a huge like anxiety, fear reaction to, what could have been interpreted as an entirely different experience in my body. And Mm. it took me a long time to sort of what I like to call it is taking a metaphysical dump. It's where you take (laughs) everything you think, you know, and everything that's like foundational to what you uh, interpret out of things and just flush it down the toilet and start from scratch. And then all the stuff that was actually real or truthful that you did flush doesn't go anywhere because you can't flush the truth. (laughs) It will still remain present and apparent to you. But if you drop the other conceptions, you can turn something that was a previously terrifying experience into something that's positive, like you described doing with the train idea. And like, for me, whenever I have that type of uh, energy feeling now, I just center myself and pay attention to what it is that I'm afraid of in that moment. And that's usually what shows me where, like, why I had like a sort of physiological anxiety type of adrenaline reaction. And it can actually give me a boost and make me feel good after I sort of flip that script uh, instead of being trapped in a delusional explanation or just the regular standard explanation of you're having an anxiety attack. Don't, so you therefore should panic because that's what people do. <laughs> I like how you said that one of the things that I've read recently is that the feeling of anxiety and excitement are the same. It's just really what you're focusing on. And that's largely what you were saying. If, if I understood correctly and it's yeah, like, definitely learning how to like emotionally upcycle or repurpose those things is I think it's critical for most people. And I think that some people do it, but unconsciously when you consciously have control over that or like train yourself to be better with it, that's like some kind of alchemy that's off the charts, dude. That's the alchemy. Mm, Fair. I mean, basically every, every gift that we have as human beings, every spiritual power that we have in consciousness, is repressed only by one thing and that's fear, whatever particular form the fear is taking or the limitation that we're imposing on ourselves takes, but through our gifts and basically the primary gift would be just awareness and presence in general to be looking at the uh, shadow for what it is. Honestly, that transforms the shadow into the spiritual powers, the synchronicities, the, the magic. And Mm. I think one, actually, I'm sure we're going to get into talking about, magic and metaphysics quite a bit. But one thing that people have as a complete misconception about magic in general is that it's something that you can use to control your reality, control your world, control other people. 
there are things that you can do that control and dominate other people. And it's even been called black magic. But to me, it's not even magic. That's actually, <laughs> that's actually just domination and control and manipulation. And it's just taken, it's been called magic because it's the, the mechanisms that are used to psychologically enslave people by controllers in society today are occulted and they're based on you know hidden knowledge that's ancient has been around for as long as all the solutions to these things like meditation and uh, like that you know have been around as well. So it's always just the awareness of the nature of the shadow that transforms it and that creates psychological defenses against it, including psychological defenses against your own self and your own preconceived notions, which is actually kind of the same thing as the external world and the conditions that you experience because within is without in the alchemical mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As above, so below as within, so without, like they say, I want to say that's uh, either the Emerald tablet or the Kabbalion where they mentioned that it's in the Kabbalion and the Emerald tablet. It's definitely in both. That's one of the main hermetic principles. They usually say as above, so below, but I think it's as within, so without a little more accurately. Uh, it's actually maybe even, as below, so above <laughs> is mm. another way of looking at it. I'm, I'm not sure. I just think that reality is definitely generated from the outside and or from the inside to the out. And whenever we're not living to our fullest is when we're being controlled from the outside, <laughs> basically, where, you know, we're ping ponging between reactions and, and uh, negative stimulus. No, I would definitely agree. Learning to um, confront your fear and, Pro progress through that like I want I want to say that's why most people don't necessarily know what their purpose is or know where their direction is in life is because there's so much fear built up around it and for me personally to find where I wanted to go um, how I wanted to live like what I wanted to do I had to go through a bunch of fear dude and it's in like the heart of that darkness that you find the light really <laughs> mm -hmm. as uncomfortable yeah. as that is like that's my experience hopefully everybody doesn't have to do it that way but you know, and this actually ties into the tarot that you were going to bring up for our talk today, which is uh, not the number 12, the hanged man card. And it was pretty cool looking artwork on that card, different than the tarot that I use, which is just the Rider Waite deck. Mm -hmm. um, but the hanged man is someone that has become comfortable being uncomfortable. It's a symbol of that. He's hanging upside down from the tree, but why like what is the point of hanging upside down what does that symbolize i think you could look at it as the world the external world is actually an upside down place <laughs> the values everything is in an entropic state things decaying every institution every building every speck of dust um is only the entropy in these things is only ever resisted by human awareness imagination intelligence and creativity and the hanged man being upside down is seeing the world actually for what it is. And it's uncomfortable, but he's balanced and in a still point seeing it for what it is. I mean, you're even your eyeballs flip the image of what you're looking at upside down. <laughs> that's why on, in a spiritual sense, we're like, I think that's why we're considered to be one level up from the underworld. <laughs> you know, that we literally are on the, like if, if reality has sort of a, a conical spiraling structure where there's a center point and then things radiate out in a wider and wider spiral and then up, up and down radiating out in wider, wider spirals. I, I kind of conceptualize the, the realm we're in as right near the middle point, but just slightly on the lower half of the spectrum. So mm -hmm. that's why all the, like the cosmic forces from source, which is the middle point, seem to be coming down on us in a sense and um you know kind of correlates to the whole notion of of gravity and and density in spiritual thought as well and the shift in consciousness is really just a shift in perspective where we elevate our perspective just that notch up back to the middle i as i see it i think that's a really uh unique way to look at it i've never heard it explained that way but it, it would make sense i mean we start, we're kind of brought down below the threshold by the way that our world is. Then when we start to get our bearings, we're kind of at the center point. And then when we kind of peek through, through doing some work, we're like 
just at the very bottom, but it seems upside down because we're so acclimated to being on the bottom. Is that kind of what you're saying? If I understand correctly? Yeah. And in a sense, just the fact that we believe that we die and that we're going to die and that from birth, there's a timer till we die. That's sort of not that different than actually being dead in a sense. Like this was the realm of the dead because everything is set to expire. And then maybe like just lower down in consciousness are um, more, even more dead. And but what is dead? What is, what does it mean to be dead? It means you're no longer moving, no longer vibrating, no longer expressing uh, source consciousness essentially. And so you can be dead without being physically dead. And many people in this realm actually are because they are aware of who they are. They aren't aware of, you know, their source or their true nature. And mm. I, I think that's where all the conceptions of the underworld and have really come to us from mythology. It's, I think, allegory to the fact that we're asleep to the truth, which is our eternal nature. And the physical body is actually just a vehicle for navigating this space of reality that we find ourselves in. We're actually not anywhere different than the middle point at any like the still center point is what humanity actually is. <laughs> you know, everything else is the Maya. Mm. I like that perspective and talking about mythology and how most, a lot of people here are dead in like the spiritual sense. They're physically living, but spiritually dead and not aware of their infinity or the infinitude or however you want to describe it. Kind of brings me, brings me to like that um, Greek myth of Tantalus. Are you familiar with that one? Absolutely. The guy who can, he's hungry, but he can never like really grasp food, thirsty, but can never drink. Like, and that's really where a lot of people are, where they have all these desires and appetites, but they're never satisfied because they don't understand that that hole that they're trying to fill with these desires and satisfaction is unfillable with material things. <laughs> like it's like a spiritual hole. And it makes me think of, um, I always re refer to this anime in some way, shape, or form when I'm talking about this kind of stuff. But the anime Bleach, and it ties back into like that shadow, um, incorporating the shadow for your power in some ways, like you were talking about earlier. That hole in you, you kind of have to fill it with awareness of your darkness and then utilize that to not be controlled by it, but to utilize it to make yourself stronger, to progress, to step up your game and refine who you are as an individual to keep progressing forward because that's what fills that hole. If, if you desire to be more than you are currently, maybe not even more, just to, I'm trying to think of how to describe it, how to come into yourself more thoroughly, maybe, because you already are at your maximum potential. You just have all these layers of doubt in front of it, I guess. Exactly. All fear really is, is the perception of the loss of personal power, essentially, hmm. you know, <laughs> in, if you realize that you actually have all the power in every situation that you're in, even a situation that is like a, a sort of a life threatening or lethal situation that you can't externally control, you are still uh, the actor that's both the actor and the author that's playing it out. The, architect of the experience's source and the infinitude as you described it and filling that hole, that hunger or yearning that all humanity has. I think why looking at the shadow part of yourself, honestly, and gaining a psychic defense against your own shadow essentially is something that actually does seem to fill that hole and also seeking um, to express yourself and figure out who you are. Those two things, the reason why those things do actually fill that void as long as you remain in the path and the pursuit of those things the, is because it's truth that you're filling the hole with. When you look at the shadow, honestly, you're looking at yourself for what you really are. I mean, it's still subjective because you can never separate yourself from subjectivity, but essentially you're seeking truth at all times. And it's just as much of an infinite hunger or yearning as what a standard person feels who doesn't want to seek the truth. And a person that's on a spiritual path might not even realize the truth is what they're seeking. They might just think I'm looking at the shadow to save myself from suffering. And I'm looking to express myself to understand who I really am. 
But actually what those things are, are the pursuit of truth and the person just might not have realized it yet. And the reason why I guess it fills the void, the void is because what truth is, is that source, unity, consciousness, the still point within all movement, the, uh, the fulcrum that balances every polarity. That's the reality. And the closer you, you get closer to that by um, integrating the shadow and, by, and expressing your true light from within. I'm sure of that. That's awesome. One of the things that really struck me when, when you were talking is um, how you kind of turn that hunger. And I was thinking like when you turn that hunger inwards, you almost effectively become the snake eating its tail because you're ah, eating yes. yourself and you're like shedding your skin as you go. And you're constantly, it's a constant cycle. So you're no longer devouring the outside necessarily. And right. And devouring the outside world for meaning is what leads to the destruction of everything <laughs> that we see. Like the, you know, the rampant greed and uh, raping of the ecosystem. And I mean, I don't have to tell anybody about that happening. It is happening. And mm -hmm. how do we play out those behaviors in our own lives? I think even the commerce system that we engage in is pretty much complicit in, in that because everyone's trying to make a buck off of each other instead of trying to hook up a family member. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, always linkable back to our own behaviors, even, even, and especially in the small things that we take for granted that are creating these drives. So, um, you know, we all want to see an end to materialism and that in culture and, you know, the superficiality of things, but, uh, you know, I still haven't had the courage to say to my family, I'm not participating in Christmas this year. <laughs> That's like, that takes balls, man. Mm -hmm. it's not because I don't I, love you I just don't want to I just don't want to do this <laughs> but I also think that going to that other extreme too is another form of darkness as well like you have to find that again like the center point of things and realize that you have to be able to have some enjoyment and you can do those things within balance and find a, like a balance point with it um yeah because for me it's like having been on one extreme of like extreme um, consumerism, ignorance, and all these things, my natural tendency was to swing back to the other extreme and try to minimize everything. And like trying to live in the modern world um, at like such a reduced level, it limits your ability to actually help other people and to connect with other people at some extent. So you have to find like that center. And that's freaking tricky, dude, yeah. especially when everything's shifting. And it's like, I don't have it figured out. I'm better off than I was, but... I know, even if you think, you know, everything that you're doing in the minimal minimizing of your sort of material footprint is for good. Uh, there's an old anecdote, like you can go give a crackhead $20 that asks you for $20. Not that I don't love a crackhead, but then if they come back to you the next week and say, well, actually, I need uh, your whole paycheck because I had a relapse and, and you give it to them because you're just in the mode of always giving. And then the next week they come back and ask for the whole thing you can give yourself completely into poverty and destitution. And if that's what you need to learn, then I guess that's what you'll do. And it's not, that's actually not in, in, you know, it's not wrong in the same way that stealing from others is wrong, but you're kind of stealing from yourself if you're taking away your own well being to give it to others. So um, I think maybe the karma is a little different if it's some self-inflicted to inflict it on others, but maybe not since it's all the same self ultimately, <laughs> you know, that's why getting you through our own bad habits and vices and, you know, physical addictions, whether it's food or other things is so, um, it has such a strong ripple effect in our immediate world and the people that are in our orbit and you see everyone around you getting better together or everyone around you getting worse together. It's kind of a trip if you're actually paying attention. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. That's one of the things for me on my own personal journey, like talking about the people that are around you. It's so interesting to think of who I surrounded myself with earlier on in life that kind of were pathways into my addiction and not to blame other people. But I've heard it say you are the five people you surround yourself with the most. Mm -hmm. So let's look at the people I hung out with then to what my circle is now and how much different my life is, is, is ridiculously fascinating. Um, do you want me to give like a brief synopsis of my story? Yeah, I think this would be a great time <laughs> to do that. Actually, let's go for it. Um, okay. So 
I grew up in, in Ohio. Um, I was very sick as a kid and all that illness kind of had a lot of attention. I'd like to also state that this is just my opinion of my experience that people in my family might have a different perspective of it, but this is just how I remember my life growing up because anyhow, I digress. <laughs> so well, I mean, at this point, the only part of it that's real is what you remember. And, uh, cause you know, you're only here and now the past isn't here. That's fair. So I was sick often, had a lot of attention on me. Um, and one of the things that I've kind of learned is I've always had the, the symptoms of an addict and the symptoms of mental health um, issues. And it became apparent at an early age. I can remember, um, I've also had this deep spirituality. Um, one of the first things I can really recall, my aunt committed suicide when I was in like fifth or sixth grade. And I can remember walking on this like frozen creek by my house and thinking about how when I died, things would be cold and black. I would be completely alone. Um, and it would just be like that forever, like just isolation and abandonment. And I don't think that's like the typical <laughs> five or six year old thought, you know? So I've always been kind of, man, I think a lot of people have traumatic repressed. They don't even remember that they thought those thoughts, you know, cause it was so bad. Sorry. I guess, I no, you're fine, dude. No, you're fine. I that's that fair. Everybody's got that a little bit, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that's a fair point too. Um, I can't be that unique in the sense that. I'm part oh, of you're everything. Unique. You're you're a snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyhow, like that was like a very defining moment. Um, and to sum up my personality in a nutshell, like I can remember there being this tranquil koi fish, like goldfish pond beside my one house, and I can remember it being calm and placid. Me seeing it turning around and just like trust falling into it and creating all these ripples. So like I've always been impulsive, spacey, kind of out there. Um, I really got introduced, like my substances that I was addicted to aren't ones that people traditionally assume or correlate with addiction, but it's more so about how I use them than the substances themselves being addictive. Um, for me, it was pot psychedelics and alcohol. I mean, everybody kind of realizes alcohol can be bad. Um, I did a lot of those things. I was introduced to a recovery program early on. I didn't really get it because I didn't think any of those people knew what the hell they were talking about. <laughs> like, um, that was probably when I was 16 or so. When I was like 20, 22, I had completed culinary school, drove cross country on like a fear and loathing in Las Vegas inspired road trip. Um, very intense experience, obviously, when you drive two, 3,000 miles on shrimps and various substances. Um, very defining in lots of ways too, to kind of fly the, the nest under those circumstances. It's uh, like a rite of passage that you created for yourself. Exactly, exactly, dude. It was like my vision quest and like that period of my life from about 2006 to about 2012. I mean, maybe even say 2016 was largely a vision quest. Like I moved around Vegas, had a lot of experiences um, there. From there, I moved to um, northern Washington, about like 45 minutes northeast of Seattle had uh, an experience there, was homeless, went down from there, down the coast to Arcata, California, slept on the beach um, in, in crappy hotel rooms for a period of weeks, moved back to Vegas, moved around a, a bunch really. And throughout all of this, I'm interacting um, with different people, defining myself, losing some layers of destructive behavior, gaining other layers of destructive behavior. And um, when it really got real for me, like, it was the summer of 2012 and this, this fascinates me so much because I was so fascinated by 2012 and thinking it was going to be a shift in consciousness. And, um, I was dating a woman and I had stopped drinking her and I had stopped drinking together and I was still smoking pot. And because I didn't really have any of the, um, the resources that I do now, like within a community of people not using substances or things like that, I didn't have any, um, pressure release valve for all the stress and things I was going through with work, with a failing relationship, with not knowing how to manage my own life effectively. Um, and I stopped, started not being able to eat, um, 
stopped being able to sleep. I started to hear like, I felt like I got this a download um, from the universe and it was telling me to write all this stuff out that I had to write this uh, story. And that this story would be something that could help people connect from this current reality to the future reality. So then these two realities could converge so we could kind of go off into infinity. And there was like all these numbers and fractals. It was in <laughs> intense. The easiest way I can describe it would be try to imagine like downloading a modern file on like one of those old school computers, like try to imagine downloading like a hundred gigabytes on like a nineties computer or something like that. That's awesome. That's a great <laughs> metaphor. It's like, uh, I don't even have the right format. <laughs> I don't know how to, but what's cool is that data is going to be with you forever, man. Uh, that download is going to be with you forever. You're going to, when people have experiences like that, that I've come across, typically they unpack that over a course of years or a lifetime. And it's, Oh, the, those of them that actually manage to successfully unpack their downloads or even tap into more downloads. Those are the people that actually create huge ripples in consciousness, how have, have an impact in our world for the better. Uh, typically speaking, I can mm -hmm. think of lots of examples. I mean, I've just been getting really into Walter Russell uh, lately who He's a contemporary of Tesla, who was also stricken from the history books that wrote a book called The Secret of Light and was basically explaining, you know, the, 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 the zero point field and how, how all matter is actually emanations of consciousness and how source consciousness is a bright, eternal uh, white light. You know, he was extremely advanced, but, you know, he was having downloads like you describe as well, but I think maybe was one of those magical people that immediately started inventing crazy things. And, you know, that's, that's even more rare, I would think, but you know, that what you're describing though, that's to stop with my tangent here. It's, it's always been fascinating to me, that notion that we can actually move into a different timeline or to a different future uh, we can communicate with our future selves to collaborate and make that happen. And I think I've had experiences with my own future self as maybe some listeners probably can attest to, especially those that have it worked with psychedelics at all, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's times now too, where like I'll have some insights into things and it's weird because they correspond to some of the things I was going through back then. And sometimes I almost wonder if my current self was communicating with myself then to kind of pull me through it to where like the future, future me was influencing then like the current me then. And it, like it, it actually, I think it does work that way because our, you know, whenever you have a practice of actually reflecting on your past, looking at digging up the shadow and reintegrating it. What you're essentially doing is bringing a new perspective to that moment or those moments. And it's a perspective that balances the energy and the shadow of those moments. And show, because, you know, it is basically the realization that it had to happen for you to be where you are now and for you to be powerful enough to even face the shadow again and overcome it. And so because consciousness is, what you are and your, you know, your perception of time is actually just a sequential experience that you're having, not anything that's actually concrete and has any reality to it. Whenever you do take your mind back into those moments and you help yourself through them, it very well, I've always thought it very well could be that you are literally sending your spirit back to that time and giving yourself assistance. And I think that that happens with people that go through traumatic um, or not just traumatic, but like extreme life threatening situations. Someone picks up a car off of their child. Someone, you know, does some kind of amazing physical feat of strength or bravery in a moment of crisis. And they say that they just felt like they had to do it and they knew that they had to do it and that there was no fear or that something was even guiding them or a voice in their head told them what to do. All of those things could be, not only your future self coming into that moment and helping you through it so that you can actually survive could be that we are actually capable of going into each other's minds or in each other's hearts and experiences and helping one another through those things as well. Maybe even cross dimensionally and maybe even when we're dreaming and you have some crazy dream where you're running from the bad guys, but you're doing all the right moves and you're saving all your friends. 
maybe that's actually some real timeline somewhere. And that person was going through such a crazy crisis that they called you in to be their spiritual guide through it so that you could give them the mental fortitude and assurance that they were able to get through it and not be afraid. And, you know, none of that's provable, but it sure is a hell of a lot of fun to think about. No, totally. I really like that line of thought. Like you kind of get to a, tap out go to sleep in this physical reality kind of be like a spiritual superhero yes. and then come back and not even really know that that's what you were doing i think some people do it and know they do it but they just don't I, talk I, about it because they would be called crazy mm-hmm. and that's like one of the things for me like after after you lose your mind completely <laughs> and you're put, <laughs> put in like a psych ward and you've had that experience like a bunch of times and you really begin to digest like what reality is from being in such non-reality. And like, I mean, I, I experienced it in shades with psychedelics because so I used to be a very heavy psychedelic user. Like, but when it happens unconsciously and you kind of come back to it and you realize you can't even explain that feeling to a lot of people in some ways. And you begin to realize how everybody is a certain shade of quote unquote crazy and how <laughs> like a normal state of consciousness is a bunch of bullshit because everybody's brain chemistry is completely different. Perception of reality is different. And I mean, some of those things come through on psychedelics. Like I didn't need to go, I didn't need to have that experience to think of, of some of those things, but like, when it occurs without a chemical and you can realize how much different the physical reality can be based upon where your head is to like a certain, like a way different level. It's mind blowing, dude. Like, and you know, you can even have what's amazing about the psychedelics though, is that they really do open that door for you to start seeing those things. Even after, even when you're no longer using the psychedelics, I myself have had a history of psychedelic use not not too much abuse in my opinion i mean not that there was n no recreational use but i don't think that recreational use is a abuse necessarily because recreation um you know i we it's our right to have to have a good time and do what we want with our minds you know mm -hmm. and not not necessarily our right to just destroy our bodies with these things but it it's our right to go into an experience for just the experience and to see what happens and have fun. And it's right to go into the experience for the intention of personal evolution and growth. The great thing about psychedelics is they tend to bring out the personal evolution and growth, even in the recreational use, even in the abuse. Um, most people don't tend to be long time psychedelic abusers. Of course that can go pretty poorly, you know, if, if that does happen, but yeah, what, what I was going to get to, though, is just how once that door is cracked, things can start happening, synchronicities involving psychedelics and states of consciousness that are very psychedelic-like will occur without even needing to ingest the substance. And so I'm going to tell a personal anecdote on that note that happened over New Year's. I was at a New Year's Eve concert that uh, was Bass Nectar in Atlanta. And so we're in a huge crowd of people, several thousand people all just watching the show. I myself was not on psychedelics at this time, but everyone's having a good time dancing. The music is great. The energy feels good. And then security walks through right in front of where we are, like shoving people out of the way, pushing through um, just a really general rough vibe and everyone's like reacting to it. And I felt the energy level drop in the area kind of, and then security pushes through again, dragging somebody coming from a different direction. And then like two seconds after that, from a third direction, another security person just starts busting through our crowd, going somewhere else. And it's like, we're getting attacked by darkness <laughs> in a way. It was like really weird. Right. Uh, Cause it all just happened at once. There hadn't been anything like that going on. And I felt, uh, I started to get a really strong stomach ache and it took me a second. And then I realized, wait, 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 there is an energetic, event happening in this vicinity right now a negative energy entered this area you don't really need to say what it is or how it happened it's not the security people that are the negative energy it's that's symbolic of it and what you're feeling internally is the truth so what are you going to do with that feeling you're going to ignore it and wait to, for it to go away or are you going to transform it right now so i like pulled all my chi together inwardly 
really focused inwardly, felt my entire body and tried to draw all of the negative vibration out of my stomach and into my hand. And I raised it up and then like right with a really crazy bass drop, I just go, just like send it all down into the earth to negate it and release it. And right as I released it, this powerful blast of uh, someone exhaling DMT comes right into my face, right as I release the energy. My stomach ache ended right then, and I started having basically like a low-level LSD-like feeling for a couple minutes. But it was super psychedelic, super trippy, like even like visually trippy, all of that occurring, not from me taking any substance. I definitely didn't inhale DMT. It was just the scent of it from nearby. But that it also synchronistically, that smell would come into my nostrils right as I made a conscious action to basically purify or negate shadow, improve my, you know, elevate my consciousness, whatever it's, you know, those type of anecdotes are completely personal, unprovable, and to many people, therefore pointless. But for me, that's just one example of way more than I could ever remember of something like that happening, revolving around psychedelics without even me needing to take them. Mm -hmm. No, I, I've definitely, um, since I've stopped their use, and I, I do want to throw this caveat out there, like, just because I was not able to use substances doesn't mean I don't think other people can, if they can, great. For me, one of the things that like was transmitted to me is kind of, do you want to be able to help people? Are you willing to give up using substances to do so? Mm -hmm. And I used to be like, yeah, and then I'd go hit a bowl. And then eventually it got to a point where like reality was just like, dude, you have to quit. And this is how you're going to get your shit together. So you can actually help people because that's what you have to do personally. Like, if you give a kid too much candy, eventually you're not going to let them have candy anymore. And that's kind of like what the universe did with me. Dude, you've done enough for like a couple lifetimes. <laughs> let some other people have it. <laughs> but like the cool thing about those kind of synchronicities that you talk about is like, that was like a large part of what the psychosis was for me in some ways. And it was trying to transmit like those experiences to people in a logical way. Cause there was a lot of physical synchronicities that occurred, but I couldn't, obviously you can't explain it to like a psychiatrist or somebody like <laughs> at a psych ward, like the things that are going on. Some of it was complete insanity though, too. But now that I'm in like a relatively um, good mental space and things like that, all these weird synchronicities still occur. Like in regards to um, some of the, the meetings that I go to for the uh, one fellowship I participate in, the daily reading sometimes will sync up right where I'm at. I'll be thinking something, but I don't voice it somebody else within the room kind of says exactly what I'm thinking. So I get the answer that I need just like all this stuff that it won't make sense to people unless they've experienced similar things like your experience or things like that, where it just, it just meshes and you're like, this could happen a couple of times in a life and, and maybe it could be chalked off to coincidence when it happens continuously. And there's, there's no sense to really talk about it or prove it to anybody. It's just, it's ridiculous, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's fun to talk about with people that can actually entertain an idea without immediately accepting or rejecting it. Because when you can do that, then someone can go, no, dude, that's crazy. Or they can say, actually, that is definitely a powerful synchronicity. You know, not that you need someone else's agreement to have, take power from an experience. You know, you, you don't have to tell somebody about a dream you had for it to have meaning to you. But with the right people, I do think sharing that type of stuff can actually enhance things as well. It just depends on the person, the situation. Um, one thing I wanted to share from you, though, we're coming up to the end of the free show, although we've got, you know, we'll have another hour if you want for plus. But I wanted to go back to the tarot because we barely touched on it. And I, um, I know you have that card pulled and maybe you can interpret a little bit of what that meant for you today in con and maybe even in context to what we've been talking about, the, uh, the hanged man card, at, you know, to get in a little bit of this metaphysical uh, action before the end of the free show. Yeah. So this one for me really is just kind of, I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can take it. Butterfly in a cocoon, being frozen and kind of suspended in a state until you can progress. I mean, with this one, there's the fire down below. So it's kind of like igniting that fire in your own mind because you're, you're frozen. And, and for me, having that come up twice, um, which I had mentioned before we started recording, um, 
having that come up twice for today essentially is just like, I've been feeling this kind of sticking point in some ways with things. And it's not like a bad sticking point. It's one of the things I actually need to learn. One of the things that I um, asked the universe to teach me last year was patience. And that's probably one of the worst things you could ever ask to be taught is patience. Cause you like, for me personally, I've got a bunch of like very um, frustrating situations, but I have been learning patience. And with this whole concept, I was listening to something about Alan Watts yesterday uh, or the day before. And he was talking about how we, we stand in our own way. And like, sometimes it'll be like this mud in a puddle and we want the mud to clear. So we'll consciously try to clear the mud from it. But that all that does is turn the mud up more. You just have to let it be. And it's like, for me, I'm like, okay, am I being patient enough yet? Can I be more patient? So I'm actively trying to be inactive in a sense, which is physically impossible. So I had a, like a moment the other day where I finally kind of just let life flow. And I was like, oh, I finally broke free. And it's funny to have this come up again where it's like, no, nah, dude, because now you're trying again. Like, just... <laughs> Is B. <laughs> yeah, that's a really difficult thing because it's like the question is the answer. And it, it's like you have to know that the question is the answer while also forgetting that you were asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Dude, that's, absolutely, man. And that's the thing that's so trippy about like most solutions is like most of them are like, enshrouded or encapsulated in a paradox in lots of ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, least, well, the entire state of existence is a paradox, right? Mm-hmm. That, that's, that's definitely fair. So why should anything else be any different? <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good. Well, before we uh, cut over to, actually, we'll get that at the end. I was going to ask you to give your links to your, your show, but let's just instead talk about your show a little bit right here. And, uh, Tell, tell me what's going on with the spiritual Phoenix. You said you've been on a hiatus, but you're preparing a new season. And uh, so, you know, what can people expect if they go back into the older seasons and what, what do you got coming up for people? Um, yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. Um, the very beginning really just kind of talks about, um, it's like a longer version of my initial experience, like what led me to podcasting my experience with psychosis in more detail, my experience with, um, the mental health. Um, I digest some philosophy in there, like people that I enjoy, like Terrence McKenna or like Alan Watts, people like that. Like I like to discuss my opinion on it. Um, largely it's about my personal growth, things that I learned, things that I do wrong. Um, and what the lesson I learned from that is to kind of like show people I don't ever want to be one of those people that like presents themselves as, as having all the answers or knowing everything or anything like that. Like I, I wanted to show my experience of recovery from these issues as I progress through it. And it's interesting for me to go back and look at the beginning, like the first episode I recorded over a year ago till now and see how much I've developed and how much more comfortable I am and like how, how much more authentic, I guess even like it's surreal, dude. Uh, um, some of the interviews are just kind of trying to find commonality with other people. Like I tried to ask the same standard set of questions to all my guests through the first two seasons, just to um, get a baseline for people's experience and try to find threads through everybody. So that way when the listener kind of checks it out, they can be like, wow, this is not unique to me. This is something that I share with everybody, but I still have my own fingerprint on that uniqueness. Like, Everybody has a fingerprint, but they're all different. So yes. that's kind of like what the first couple seasons were about. And as far as what I want to do coming up, um, I've really been diving deeper into spirituality in a sense, like over this, um, over this hiatus, I got a, uh, uh, a, a shoe rack turned it into like a mini altar kind of set up like some things that my grandfather made that my dad had made like as kind of like an ancestor altar or connection to that kind of stuff. Um, I started diving into chaos magic somewhat or my understanding of it, which is 
kind of why there's sigils behind me, <laughs> like wrap, wrapped around the art that I, I did. Um, some people do like New Year's resolutions. I did New Year's sigils. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I want to talk, uh, I'm going to start exploring this concept of drifting in the next season. Uh, try to get some like panel discussions going on, re-interview some old people, have older guests come on and maybe not even re-interview, have previous guests come on and discuss their own topics and kind of let me just learn, I guess, so people can see me digest other people's stuff instead of frothing at the mouth as I talk about stuff that I like to. Um, yeah, I just hope my podcast can be that way someday where I just bring someone on and let them talk the whole time and I just absorb all the info. Because <laughs> it's a big part of doing this work is you get to learn about yourself and about a lot of other people's st- uh, what they're doing, what they've been through in a form where it really sinks in more to have a conversation with somebody than to go watch their video or something. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot more, there's like an exchange of energy. And it's like one of the things that I really enjoy about like interviewing people is getting to have that. Cause like some people will say something and just like a couple words are different or their approach is a little different and it, fractals off into like this completely different understanding. Like I'm sure when, when you come on my show and when, when like it, it syncs up, it's going to be phenomenal, dude, because I guarantee you have some stuff that's going to be like a bomb, <laughs> <laughs> like a knowledge bomb or whatever you want to call it. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe a knowledge seed is a better way to say it. It's a little bit more positive visualization. I Well, I hope to be able to fulfill that expectation. I definitely, I've been throwing myself into studying everything I can about how the self operates both internally and externally and all those mechanics and, you know, being able to talk about that stuff in almost a teaching capacity, just through expounding on it is a really good way of solidifying what it is that you learn and what it is that you actually take away from that stuff, you know? until you even have a conversation with somebody, sometimes certain ideas that you actually do have and hold never emerge. And the wonderful thing about these crazy minds that we have that sometimes incapacitate us with thoughts is that we do have so many thoughts, thousands and thousands of thoughts a day, probably like 60 or 80, 100,000 thoughts in a day. Who knows? And, you know, creating sigils, creating podcasts, all of these are ways of taking a thought that would normally just be dust in the wind and concretizing it into something that can actually then resonate out into the world. And then that thought actually can exist in the world physically and manifest things through the intention behind that thought. It's, you know, sigils are a really useful way of doing that. I've had experience with some sigil magic in my past and it's, to go back to what I get, what I said about magic in, in the beginning, it's not about controlling your reality through, through something like magic. And a point that I failed to make earlier is that what real magic actually is, is the ability to change your own consciousness through your intention. That's really all it is. A shift in consciousness that you will, <laughs> instead of a shift in consciousness that is done unto you. Mm-hmm. That's one of the things that I think was like a major game changer for me in general was like learning to shift consciousness. And then when I finally like kind of cracked the shell and realized that that's what magic was about, that it's not like necessarily that these doing these certain things makes the change, but putting the intention on these situations and kind of, um, communicating with reality or the universe in general with those intentions and making the ritual stand out in my mind is what makes it effective more so. And I could, I could be miss, I could not have the complete information on it, but that's my current understanding of it. And it's like, so that's what this is. It's the same thing as doing these other things that have helped me, but in a more artistic, like enjoyable way, I guess, in some ways. Well, even when a teacher puts a poster up in their classroom, <clears throat> in their classroom, excuse me, and it says, um, you can do it, <laughs> whatever it says, like some positive message, that's sigil magic, actually. That is containing an idea that is meant to shift someone's consciousness in a positive direction in 
that's caps encapsulated in a symbol that's you know posted somewhere. People don't look at it like that. People do magic all the time, every day, in just about everything that they're doing because whatever it is that you're doing is cutting a little bit deeper groove in your own consciousness in a neural pathway towards doing more of that. And nature sort of works that way. It works in ripples and patterns and and things being on repeat because things are vibrations, they're frequencies, they uh they wiggle like that. <laughs> <laughs> they reemerge. When you said wiggle, it made me think how Alan Watts always talks about wiggles. You ever listened to Alan Watts at all? Definitely, yeah. <laughs> that dude's one of my most favorite lecturers. Sorry, that was just like a, a random about, thought. What do you say about wiggles? I can't remember. I don't remember anything specific, but he just kind of talks about how everything's wiggles. So basically saying everything is like that wave, that wave pattern. Yeah. Well, and then, well, I guess that's the Maya. That's the illusion. That's the external experience. And then the, the true ultimate reality is the still point in the middle of the wiggle. Mm. That's the thing that's, that's the thing that's most hidden and most difficult to get at and most difficult to express. One of the guests on my podcast in uh, season two uh, had a quote where she said, everything is still. And that resonated with me so much. And it's one of the things that I try to like dial into it sometimes when I'm stressed is that everything is still. And I guess it is like you said uh, about the Maya and the illusion of everything seeming like it's in this constant state of chaos and flux, but everything is really just chill. It's just my own ego that wants to see myself separate from the stillness and tranquility of everything. Yeah. And it goes along with, human the idea of human nature which can be so sabotaging to us to think that our nature is inherently sinful or deceitful or violent or what have you any of these things in truth our nature is what we are becoming in this moment which mm -hmm. is ever changeable and that's also why it's we are infinite is because we could express in an infinite variety of ways in any moment Talking about how we always are in this moment and we're always in this constant state of change makes me think of, um, have you ever read any of Jim Morrison's poetry? Sadly, no. One that I would suggest that you read, because I don't want to misquote it and make a fool out of myself, it's called Time Works Like Acid, but it really is about that same kind of concept of somebody, uh, talks, he talks about a woman being in a car and her face being a thousand different women within that time period because she is this constant state of change essentially i forget what book it's in but just look up time works like acid sometime and read it dude it's phenomenal well i looked it up just now uh, okay not too long time works like acid stained eyes you see time fly the face changes as the heart beats and breathes we are not constant we are an arrow in flight the sum of the angles of change her face changed in the car. Eye and skin and hair remain the same, but a hundred similar girls succeed each other. Well, that's pretty weird. It's awesome. Dude, I love that poem. Like, it's awesome though, man. Yeah, I've had feelings before where like in a relationship experience, all of a sudden I feel that I'm in the exact same, that I'm with the person that I was with in the past and they're just in a different body. And then mm. it feels like really, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's almost like a peek behind the, the veil and like remembering, oh, wait, all these people around me are just actor. They're just basically the one eternal true self acting like they're this person. And so, of course, if you're really present, you're going to feel like this is the same conflict that I've had in the past or the same even positive experience that I've had with someone in the past because it kind of is the same person in a way. And being really there with them and beyond the ego identification lets you feel the actual truth of the experience. And it's the, it's the separateness, the, this is a unique special snowflake that actually kind of screws with our heads a little bit because then we get scared about what happens when the snowflake melts. Mm. There'll be more snowflakes. <laughs> That right there is one of the things that I'm really kind of trying to digest in my personal life because relationships have been um, a nebulous thing for me. And it's really understanding that that attachment is what creates the, the, um, the, the heartache, I guess, so much of it is being attached to that snowflake and trying to hold it is what makes it melt as well. So it's, yeah, it's a trip, dude. <laughs> 
Hey, Ross, let me get you to, you know, plug your work, tell people where to find you other than the spiritual Phoenix. Uh, it's the spiritual Phoenix.com. That's your website, but anywhere else you want to give people links to anything you want to close out with the floor is yours, my friend. Ah, thank you, Chance. I really appreciate the opportunity to come on and discuss things with you. And I look forward to um, having you on my podcast and chatting with you and learning more about you. Um, the best place you could find me um, outside of my website would be I have a Facebook, which is at Spiritual Phoenix. Um, the only difference between that and the website is Phoenix is spelled F-O-E-N-I-X. Um, I have Spiritual Phoenix Tarot, again, uh, F-O-E-N-I-X Tarot. Um, and then those are Instagram ca- accounts as well. I also have one other podcast, which is the Phoenix Poetry Podcast. And you can find that as well as the Spiritual Phoenix Podcast on SoundCloud, um, Apple, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Blueberry, I want to say. So I got all sorts of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a hustle getting it all out there, man. I totally feel you. Yeah, it's it's something fun though, man, and it keeps me um, going. And it's nice to have been able to take a couple months off and just kind of uh, be in stasis with things and just kind of let new things spring up, so I can move forward with recharged uh, vitality. Cool, man. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you on here. I definitely enjoyed getting to know you a little better. Be happy to have you back on the show later on down the road. Talk about things that you're doing in the future and well, best of luck to you with your uh, upcoming next season of the show and I hope the listeners get over and check out what you're doing and especially explore some of um, the things that we've talked about whether it be tarot or meditation or you know g- going more deeply into their own personal expression of truth whatever form that may be so thanks for coming on man it was a lot of fun and I'll talk to you soon Thanks, man. Peace. Boom! Another episode down. Huge thanks to Ross Cessna for coming on. I always appreciate somebody who is brave enough to fearlessly show their shadow to the world and explore explore their own journey openly in a way where others can maybe follow along and learn something too. So, props to you, Ross, and... Anyone out there listening that's like, man, maybe I should start a podcast and share my healing journey with the world. Well, why shouldn't you? I don't know. You ought to. Or maybe you can come on here and talk with me if you don't want to go through all the trouble because it's it's a fair amount of trouble to do podcasting, which is why you have the option of helping me make this job a little easier by contributing a voluntary donation on Patreon. I'm actually able to provide some rewards for that type of a gift. So if you're interested in supporting the show, helping me get new equipment, helping me expand the reach of the show, helping me get, you know, silly things like business cards, which actually help quite a bit when you are out in the world and you want to connect with somebody, uh, having a little piece of art with your information on it goes a long way. So thanks to the patrons that are already helping me because I just did purchase a nice set of snazzy business cards. And yeah, all kinds of things like that are completely out of reach without support from you, the listeners. And like I said, in return for your voluntary donation, you'll get some perks. This episode is actually twice as long if you're a plus subscriber, literally twice as long. So if this is a show that you actually hop on most every week or you catch up every now and then and listen to a lot of the episodes, you might really consider that you could double your pleasure, double your fun double your whatever it is we do here just with a small voluntary donation of five dollars a month and you'll also get access to patron hangout chats which i said last episode i was going to tell you this episode when the january one's going to be i lied i don't know yet i haven't set a date but i'm going to do that soon and stay tuned to social media uh patreon especially if you are already a subscriber there to see when that's going to happen because as many of you who want to join us can, we do these cool patron hangouts where it's just sort of a free ball and convo. And I try not to talk and let other people from the audience normally take their turn having a open discussion with others about whatever it is they want to talk about. Re-expression, baby. 
really don't care. I definitely don't direct the conversations towards the metaphysical and the consciousness oriented things that I'd like to talk about on the main show. It is really all about you guys. So you can get early access to episodes. You can get double length episodes. You can get a feed of my artwork and some other things as well, all for different levels of donations over on Patreon. I do hope you guys check it out. At least check out the link in the uh, episode notes here to spiritualphoenix.com. And if you happen to already be there checking out links, you can check out the Patreon link for Interverse, patreon.com forward slash Interverse. There's some other ways you can help the podcast. Uh, You could always leave a review on iTunes. You could... (coughs) I don't know, you can share this with your own social media network. You could give somebody in person a tip that they might like what we do on Interverse. I don't know. That's up to you. If you want to reciprocate some of the energy that I put into this thing, then you can do that in your own way or just reciprocate by making your own life a little bit more artistic and scientific as we discussed in the episode. I don't know if that was in the plus part or the main part, but... If you want to know what we talked about in the plus, we kind of discussed a few things that were pretty much right on topic with everything we were talking about originally, like giving up the idea of fixing other people and working on yourself instead, practicing, you know, practicing solutions instead of just talking about them. That's so hard for me, but what can we do? Uh, We're only human. Magic as the synthesis of art and science. Yeah, I guess that was in the plus extension, but we did talk about that, how magic is sort of uh artistic science in a way it's adding creativity and flair to uh your experimentation on your own reality experience and you know that sort of represents the self-initiation of modern occult knowledge and occult thought uh, and higher truths we talked about self-initiation a lot we talked about the reality that nobody is in control of reality talked about meditation and balancing the left and right brain But best of all, and I hope this is a hook to get you guys to check out Patreon and maybe subscribe, I explained why I cut off those gorgeous, nappy dreadlocks I had going, and now I look like just a regular dude. (laughs) Anyway, looks aren't everything, I guess, and my hair will grow back. I had to uh, cut it off. I dishonored my ancestors. Actually, that's not really it. If you want to know why I did that, get on plus. Anyway... I suppose that's enough for tonight. I'll wrap this up. You guys are beautiful. I love you so much. Thank you for listening. I really couldn't do any of this podcasting thing without you listeners, even you free people. I love you too, even though you're freebies. And I wanted it to be free, so I guess it's not really something to complain about. Uh, And that's it. Love you all and talk to you later. Thank <laughs> you.